Hello and welcome to YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Christina Souza Ma, and with me is our wonderful medical guide, Dr. Glenn Woolman. Hello, Doc. How's it going? Awesome. Yay. Yes. I, uh, <laughs> another exciting day. Always exciting days. Mm -hmm. uh, greetings, everybody. Welcome to Magical Medical Tour. I'm Dr. Glenn Wallman. I will be your medical guide along with Christina today as we search yet another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy looking for optimal health. And we may find it today. I do believe we will. Yes, we're going to be interviewing Burton Wagner, a chiropractor, and as our title says, chiropractic and beyond. We're going to be talking about a number of things that he does, uh, including chiropractic and some of the new things that he's working on. But before we do, Christina, how do people get in touch with us? <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. At any time during the show, you can feel free to ask a question or make a comment simply by scrolling down on your screen and typing it into the comment box. Now, you might be seeing this show a month from now, six months from now, a year from now. It really doesn't matter. You can type in your question or your comment, and we will be sure to get it off to either our guest or Dr. Woolman or answer it uh, directly ourselves. So not an issue. And if you are listening to this through one of your wonderful devices, as we all do these days... Um, simply pick up the phone and call us at 818-LET'S-TALK, 818-LET'S-TALK. Be sure to leave your contact information and uh, we will get back to you as soon as we can. Thank you, Glenn. Wonderful. And we always say, uh, if you ever have ideas for the show or anything you want to talk about, any topics or types of guests you would like us to uh, interview, uh, please let us know that also. Christina, I want to... Uh, I want to do a little housekeeping first before we meet uh, Dr. Wagner. Mm -hmm. In our last episode, Inside the Doctor's Bag, we talked about Assembly Bill 15 in California. It was the end-of-life options. And while we were doing the show, uh, the Assembly was voting on it, and we were never able to report uh, the outcome. So I want to just give a little bit of update. And part of the reason I'm doing this is for people in California, where it's very important, but also in other states, many people have expressed an interest in having something like this in their state and just want to let you know how to go about it. So basically, uh, in the assembly, they voted on it and they passed it. So that was really good. And mm -hmm. then it, it had to go, because it was amended in the assembly, it had to go back to the Senate. And then the Senate actually passed it also. So with both houses uh, in California passing it, it went to the governor's desk, Gov Governor Jerry Brown. And he's had it on his desk for a little while now, and he has three options. He can either sign it into law, which would be great. He can veto it, which would not be great. And then I believe it would go back to the houses to see if they would override mm -hmm. his veto. And if they didn't, then it would go, uh, if people wanted to put it on a ballot, aside from the uh, legislative branch, they could do that. And the third option is he does nothing. And if he does nothing, my understanding is it will also become law. So we're going to know this within the next few days because it has to be done before October. Now, if he doesn't do a thing. Right. It becomes law. It still that, becomes law. That's the way I understand it. So he has uh, three options, veto it, sign it into law, or do nothing. And because the legislative branches uh, voted in the bill, mm -hmm. it becomes law. Ah, interesting. So that's very good. Uh, and I wanted to let our uh, viewers and audience know about that because I know we've been following that very carefully. So on with today, we're very happy to meet and introduce Dr. Burton Wagner. He's been a chiropractor for over 14 years. He's got a very interesting story of where he started and his practice, and he's bringing in some new things into his practice that we're going to talk about today. And without further ado, I would like to introduce to all of our guests, Dr. Burton Wagner. Greetings, Burton. Uh, greetings. Hello, Hello everyone. Do Hello, Dr. Wagner. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Burton, as the medical guide, I always like to tell our audience where we're going. We want to find out a little mm -hmm. bit about you, uh, the heart and soul of Burton Wagner, and we want to find out how you got into chiropractic, and then we want to talk about some of the new programs you're working on, uh, which includes uh, spinal analysis, 
uh, network spinal analysis. You'll correct me on that, I'm sure. I'll and just also, explain it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the Bliss program, mm -hmm. which automatically sounds great. Uh, that's the idea. So, and so that's where we're going to go today. How's that sound to you? It sounds great to me. Sounds Excellent. great to me. Excellent. So let's start uh, from the beginning, uh, the genesis of uh, Burton Wagner. Where <laughs> <laughs> the Genesis. It started a long, long time ago. Right? Which lifetime? In a galaxy far, far. Which lifetime? That's a good one. That's I'm not great. sure. Well, let's talk. Let's uh, well, let's take this guy. Lifetime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we may divert at some point as as the opportunity calls. What mm -hmm. got you interested in becoming a healer? It, it's kind of an interesting question. Um, when when I was young, when I was eight, nine, ten years old, uh, very often I had my hands on my family, giving massages and just uh, having that physical contact, that idea of making making things better. Um, but I never really thought about going into it as a field, in part because when I was younger, I was more interested in playing than actually studying. Uh, and oh, wow. when I was about 10, my mom actually said to me, she goes, you know what, you should be a chiropractor. Where wow. it came from, why, wow. I'm not too sure. But yeah, it's, you know, I have that memory of her throwing that out. And uh, through just a course of life events, I had gone through uh, undergrad, I'd gone through a couple other uh, professions, uh, but I was bored. Every time I was doing something, I ended up getting bored and there was just routine. And that idea of chiropractic came back to me. I said, okay, I'll go take some classes. I took some classes. I fell in love and I put myself back in school to become a chiropractor. And that's really how I ended up where I am now. Wait, were either of your parents in healing or chiropractic or do you have any other brothers and sisters that they also said the same things to? No. No, I'm the uh, I'm the only one in I'm the only one in chiropractic. I have uh, I have an older sister. She's a psychologist. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess you could say there was a little bit of that idea of uh, of still healing present. Right. But uh, sure. no, neither neither one of my parents were involved in uh, in a healing profession. Now you said, and I don't know if you said this for two different reasons, but my understanding, you said that uh, you were in chiropractic school and you fell in love. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, did you fall in love just with chiropractic, or did you fall in love with anyone else? No, I actually fell in love with, uh, with one of my fellow students. Uh, <laughs> I, I ended up meeting my wife, Emma, there. That, uh, it's really turned out to be, uh, turned out to be a blessing. Uh, a blessing, one, because I love her and having her in my life is amazing, um, but also another blessing in that um, there's, there's a philosophy behind chiropractic about health and healing in the body, and having a partner who is on the same page as you are and in that same interest of growth, uh, it's a blessing to have a partner like that. Uh, beautiful. Yeah. So for, for our... Uh, audience of people that are thinking about going into chiropractic, what's the actual training for that? The the training for a chiropractor, it's actually very similar to uh, to becoming a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. There's uh, basic science undergraduate courses to take, uh, and then when you get into chiropractic school, it's going to be a three and a half, four year program. It's about 4,400 hours total of mm -hmm. classes and then also uh, internship, uh, internship hands-on training. So, uh, so it, takes, it takes a little bit of time, a little bit of effort, but it's, uh, it's well, well worth it. So we're versed in all of the basic sciences, the biology sciences, um, and then where things really diverge is, um, is at a point in education where doctors will get more into doing their medical doctor with the diagnosis and other treatment options. As a chiropractor, we get more into anatomy and really uh, anatomy, the human structure, the human skeleton, and then how we're going to do our, uh, our adjustments, how we're actually going to address the body. We talked a lot about chiropractic with, in another interview with Dr. Richard Fox. Tell us the uh, philosophy of chiropractic. The, the basic philosophy of chiropractic is that there is, uh, there's an innate intelligence inside of everyone, which is really this driver for health. Um, and that if there's something that interferes with that innate intelligence expressing itself fully, 
we're going to have less than optimum health. That's really the the philosophy. It's a very holistic philosophy found, I think, in a lot of different uh, in a lot of different traditions. That there is this internal force, this healing force, and anything which interferes with it prevents us from actually having the most optimal health possible. And in chiropractic, what we do is we focus in on the spine and the nervous system. Nervous system being the spine, the spinal nerves, and then also the brain as a part of that being really that driver of communication in, in how the body is optimizing its health or not. So that's like really simple in a nutshell. And then there's yeah. some metaphysical aspect to it, and there's a more mechanical aspect to it. Give us a metaphysical aspect. The metaphysical, it's really fun because Dee Dee Palmer, who uh, is actually credited as being the, uh, the founder of chiropractic, even though this working with the human frame dates all the way back to uh, Egyptian times, uh, really to antiquity. Um, he's the one who's really considered the developer here in the U.S. And, uh, and when he started it, he, he said that chiropractic is for reuniting man the physical with man the spirit. Hmm. Really in that essence that if we're going to really be healthy, it's, uh, it's that spiritual aspect and richness in each one of us that needs to be connected with our physical self to really be healthy and be well. Oh, very nice. Oh, yeah, so that's a little bit more that metaphysical side, but uh, but today that tends to kind of get um, overlooked a little bit more. Mm -hmm. uh, in the with a lot of the chiropractors that I've worked with, they seem to uh, almost go to that even more after a certain amount of time. Maybe out of mm -hmm. school, they're more into the physical adjustments and things like that. But then slowly over time a lot more of them go to the metaphysical. Do you find that uh, also, or is that just my experience? You know, I find I do find that happening. Um, and I think I find that in with some who just work in more of a mechanical approach, and then after a while, a mechanical approach only takes us so far. Um, and then we either just decide to kind of stay within that framework um, and understand that we can only go so far, or there's that desire of like, okay, well, that took me this far. What else is there, um, which animates us as as living living beings? Um, what else can be added in? So I think that's where some really go off more in that direction, uh, mm -hmm. and and others no. I find it's been more of like a personal, uh, sure, that personal quest uh, of within that doctor and that healer. Um, sure, yeah. So you finished. You and your wife. Were you? Did you get married in uh, chiro in chiropractic school? Did you have a chiropractic type wedding or no? <laughs> no that, Is there a that, special that, ceremony? That would have been. That actually would have been really special. But uh, but no, actually, my wife is French. Um, she finished school just uh, about six months before I did. She had already been here in the U.S. for four years, uh, invited me to basically go back to France with her, and, uh, and that's where we ended up having our wedding, back, uh, back in France. Uh, très bien. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we can continue in French if you want. <laughs> I, I would like to, but I'd hate to leave Christina out of it, and Segovia may not know when to switch. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> switch cameras. Uh, so... You um, did you ever start your practice in California, or did you go right to to France? I went went right to France, and that's where you mm -hmm. opened up your first practice. Mm -hmm. Do the oh, French no. have different spines than we do? <laughs> you know what? I could say yes, but uh, <laughs> everybody. No, that's you know what I love is everybody has a different spine, uh, and I can actually tell a lot about a person by touching their spine. Oh. What, kind, what kind of life they've had, what their character is like. Um, so did the French have a different spine? There's a different culture and there's a different uh, mentality, a way of looking at life. So yeah, their spines are a little bit different than, mm -hmm. uh, than most Americans. And but when we get into just the bones and the ligaments, uh, that, that's all the same. Do you find that culture has any significance on the healing aspects of chiropractic, say, comparing Europe to uh, the United mm. States. Any thoughts on that? Well, I think culture definitely has, uh, has an impact, an influence, uh, not only on chiropractic, but any, any healing field, any healing art. Um, 
what we accept in the cultural story really determines kind of how practitioners can practice in the mainstream. Um, in in Europe, uh, in Europe, there's uh, there's less of the metaphysical aspect within chiropractic, um, but that's also a little bit more in France. The French are very cerebral, they're very intellectual. So, uh, so the the more physical uh, physical aspect and scientific aspect is much more uh, pushed forward. Um, not to say that there aren't other chiropractors really stretching the boundaries and doing all kinds of amazing things, but uh, as a general practice, I find that that's just been the, the the general push along for a while is just getting chiropractic more into this mainstream uh, uh, structured scientific. Um, uh, mindset in which there are amazing benefits, but then also it's like we were just talking about earlier. You know, there are some chiropractors, some other healers who at one point they start stepping outside, realizing that there needs to be something more. Uh, so, uh, so I find that, and a lot of that is the culture that, that defines what is acceptable and, and what's weird. <laughs> <laughs> what, while you were in, uh, France, practicing. What part of France were you in? Just to... It was down in, uh, in the southwest. Uh, so it's over on the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic border with the Atlantic Ocean. And we were down close to the border with Spain. So we're about mm. an hour away from the border with Spain, um, mm. south of Bordeaux. To give everybody like uh, a town they can kind of fix in on to look on a map, we were a couple hours south of Bordeaux in a town called Po. So did you drink more Spanish wine or French wine? French wine. Okay. French wine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but there was definitely some Spanish wine to be had as well. While you were over there, you were practicing your, the chiropractic that you learned here, but then you got mm -hmm. influenced uh, into expanding. Yeah, yeah. It's while, uh, while we were practicing there, uh, through my training seminars, I met uh, Dr. Yannick Pauli. Uh, he's a Swiss, uh, Swiss chiropractor. Swiss doctor who actually developed uh, developed the program on which we based the Bliss program in uh, in our office, and so we're very fortunate while we're there in Europe to be uh, be so close to him, and be able to do a specialized training with him in addressing uh, you know using the nice big word neurobehavioral disorders, which is just a, a big way of saying addressing orders of attention issues, behavior issues, learning developmental delays. So anything from ADD, ADHD to dyslexia, it could be a reading problem uh, based on how the eyes are moving, all the way on to the uh, autistic spectrum. And what, so it's, yeah. what was the appeal to this? I mean, you were just starting out in your chiropractic. You were, well, maybe you were there for about 12 years, so you were probably yeah. doing it for a long time. What was the appeal of the Bliss program? You know, the big appeal of it was that I recognized there was a need for, there was a need for it, and there was a growing need for it, um, because there are, there are lots of adults these days who, uh, who, who talk about their experiences as, uh, as a kid, actually with ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, some difficulty just in terms of family life, in terms of getting through school, um, how it was difficult then, they've learned more or less to cope now. There's more and more kids that are getting these diagnoses, that are having these, uh, these issues. And I recognize that if we're really going to have an amazing future to live into and for our kids to live into, um, we, need to start, we need to start addressing this. Um, and so that was my big push, knowing that uh, Dr. Pauli had been spending already about 10 or 12 years diving into all of the different aspects of what can possibly be going on, what can possibly be happening, and how can we address it in the most holistic fashion possible, have the greatest impact possible. Was, um, was he also a chiropractor? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, did you, uh, you also did a spinal, network spinal analysis? Mm-hmm, yes. Uh, which came first for you? The egg. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, net, net, network spinal analysis, it uh, came first. It's everything, everything I find tends to come full circle if, uh, if we're patient enough. 
Um, so starting off chiropractic, I had a real desire of uh, getting deeper into neurology and then also uh, oriental medicine. I'd always been very interested in oriental medicine. Um, and just in going along that path, I was introduced to, uh, to my chiropractor who was practicing network spinal analysis. Uh, at that time, it was just called network chiropractic. Right. And, uh, and just in seeing the way she was working and what was happening and then, you know, feeling it within my own body, I just, I knew, okay, this is, this is what I want to do. Mm. And then it's interesting because with the Bliss program, I've actually been able to come back around to uh, a lot more of the neurology that I was interested in. Not that I ever let it go, but uh, just as a, a point of focus that I've been able to come back to it and really uh, jump in both feet again. I want to stay within uh, the time frame and the timeline. So since network spinal analysis was first for you before the Bliss program, which yes. we will cover in a little while, what's the training and philosophy of network spinal analysis and how does that differ from uh, standard chiropractic? So uh, standard chiropractic, any chiropractor who goes through the education uh, receives the same basic education. And we'll come out learning uh, a few different techniques for, in chiropractic, we say adjusting the spine, mm -hmm. adjusting the body. Um, so there's basic techniques in any core curriculum that any chiropractor graduating will have knowledge of. Beyond that, there are other additional techniques that you will take outside seminars. And for, uh, for quite a few of those techniques, there's actually a governing organization. Uh, so within network spinal analysis, there are uh, just outside seminars to be taken. Um, there are different levels of applying the work. And then there's also a certification exams uh, just for really showing your level of, uh, of excellence within the work. So there's uh, a level one, a level two, and then a level three. Uh, I'm a level three certified uh, network spinal analysis practitioner. Just been been involved with the work for probably about twenty years, the receiving and and learning. Um, so uh, so so within that, that's really the if you want to be working with somebody who is really at the top of the game and continually going to the seminars, you'll find somebody who is uh, who is certified in the work. Um, and then there are other people who just who take the seminars, who learn some of the work and, and are applying it. And one of the big differences between network spinal analysis and traditional chiropractic knows that if joints get fixated and immobile, there's not all the information getting to the brain to process what's going on in the body. So they'll find that area that's stuck, they'll input a force in that area to get that open and flowing and moving again, removing removing tension from the joint itself, removing tension from all the nervous uh, structures uh, associated with that joint. In network spinal analysis, we're going to look at that area that's tight and locked up as an area that's, that's in defense. And if area of the body is in defense, that's not the area that we're going to be interested in inputting a force because we don't want on any level to drive the overall system a little bit deeper into defense. Mm. So we're actually going to address an area uh, that within, within network spinal analysis, we call it a spinal gateway. Um, but basically, it's an area along the spine, in the neck, or down in the pelvis, uh, the two areas where the parasympathetic nervous system is, is uh, predominantly associated. And we're just going to make a very light touch in this area that's open and responsive, that in essence is just sending a message up to the brain, uh, saying, hey, you know, you're holding a lot of tension in this part of your body, in that part of your body. What can you do about it? And, uh, and so it's really that idea of right place, right time. No matter where you are in life, with your spouse, with a friend, with business, if you're in the right place at the right time, very little effort is needed to make it all happen. And that's really the idea in network spinal analysis. Burton, you said something that I didn't quite understand. You talked about when a joint, for example, is blocked, it's not getting messages to the brain. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? I'm not quite sure what that means. So, ni nice word for that is called a disaffrontation. Disaffrontation. So, there are uh, there's a receptors all around the joints, just like there are in the muscles. Mm -hmm. And as these receptors are stimulated, 
they're sending information to the brain about what's happening in the body. So when there is a lack of motion in a spinal joint, there's what's called disaffrontation. All of those receptors are not being stimulated, so all of that information to get up to the brain, to give the brain a concept of where the body is in space, what's happening within the body and around the body, all of those messages don't get up to the brain. Mm -hmm. So instead of getting 100% communication, we're getting, you know, maybe 80%. And okay. to, to make it easy, it's like your cell phone. If you see four bars on your cell phone, you know you're good to go no matter where. Okay. If you I only see two bars or three bars, is it going to mm. work? Sure it is. Is it going to be the best? No, not necessarily. Um, so that's that idea of disaffrontation. Mm. Okay, that, that clears it up for me. Mm -hmm. So it's actually getting messages, it's just not getting all of them because the joint isn't moving fully to say that all proprioceptive responses are not there. How does yeah. somebody uh, make a choice whether to go to a chiropractor or a network spinal analysis chiropractor? And why does someone make that choice? Yeah, that's, that's, a, good, uh, that's a very good question. Um, I'd say one of the biggest differences between most uh, network spinal analysis chiropractors and traditional chiropractors, uh, within network spinal analysis, there is very much a, a growth perspective in how we're working. Um, that it's not so much going to be necessarily treating a condition as much as seeing a change and an evolution in how the body is operating. A lot of times it can go by force. Some people really like uh, heavy-handed body work. So those individuals seeing a more traditional chiropractor who's going to do that dynamic uh, spinal adjustment, they're going to feel a lot more comfortable with, uh, with the work that's getting done with that traditional chiropractor as opposed to a very light touch uh, in a network spinal analysis office. Um, it, I find really that, you know, it's the practitioner, we've got to find somebody who's on the same page and has the same message and the same application that fits for us in life. Talk um, about that a little bit more in terms of you're, you're almost saying you interview your chiropractor. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important to interview not only your chiropractor, but any of your healthcare, healthcare practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, we all have... We all, I, my own personal, I've been trained, so naturally I know a little bit more than just the standard person. But we all have beliefs on what it takes to be healthy, um, what we need to do to be healthy. And I think we need to have a, a health care practitioner who's on the same page as us. So mm -hmm. to find a good chiropractor, I would say definitely have a conversation. Do they do structural adjustments? Is it, uh, is it, uh, is it that dynamic input of force? Or do they work with a softer, gentler technique? What do you prefer in terms of work being done with you and your body? Um, is it going to be just a very quick visit? Is there going to be some time spent uh, working through things? Is it just going to be a, a mechanical approach? You have a mechanical issue and you need it resolved. Do you realize that your body is not really functioning at its best and you're looking to take it up to the next level? So finding a practitioner who's really going to work with you and meet you where you're at and help take you where you want to go, that's the practitioner really ideally that you want to get associated with and working with. And no. Can you find that before you make the appointment? Is that information out there so that you can make those decisions before you make the appointment? Or do you have to make the initial appointment and sit down and have the discussion before you decide you're going to them? You know, I think you can get a really good idea looking at a lot of uh, chiropractors' websites. Most chiropractors have websites. Um, and looking at their website, typically there's going to be a part of that website that's going to that's gonna talk about them. Mm -hmm. who they are as a person, what their philosophy is, what their ideas are, um, and then also talk a little bit about their, their practice. So right then you're going to get an initial impression if this practice is more kind of like a physical medicine, um, just mechanical approach to a physical issue, or if this is an individual who's interested really in working with you as an individual and your health overall. And then beyond that, just calling and, and asking one or two questions, uh, even to the, uh, to the secretary, to the assistant who answers the phone. Um, uh, most chiropractors would be open to having a five-minute conversation, really. 
Yeah, oh, very good. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a, a quick aside question before we move on. If you have something going on with yourself, let's say you have a joint that's uh, not working correctly, can you self-adjust or do you go to a, can you go to a gateway and, and open something up there or do you usually have someone else do that for you? Okay, so that's the thing that I love about network spinal analysis is as we go through the care, it actually increases our own awareness for, for our body, for our spine, our breath, our energy, our movement. Um, so that really, can I adjust myself? Yes. And I do it all the time. Do I still need, uh, do I still need help? Uh, do I still like going and getting checked? Yeah, definitely. Um, because I don't see everything there is to see. Uh, mm -hmm. But like I said, the thing I love about network spinal analysis is that it does. It takes a simple movement of reaching with the arm that then that change in tension along the structure of the body is enough to allow the body, the spine, to start readjusting itself. Um, oh. And every, everybody has that ability and that capacity, but it's, uh, it's a skill that needs to be learned. It's the nervous system has to be operating like that fast, constantly reacting to what's going on, and with the flexibility that all those forces move freely through the body, which is not the case, I find, with the majority of people. That uh, There's much more of a defense mode that we live in. There's much more of a stiff, rigid. Mm -hmm. um, and that just impedes that natural process from happening on its own. But what's really cool is we get to turn it around. I've, I've heard a number of different uh, chiropractors in network spinal analysis that mm -hmm. actually in some cases can treat a number of people at the same time in a in a room uh, a mm -hmm. number of people on on their gurneys or their beds is that something that you do a lot or how do you feel about that yeah i feel i feel good about in my in my office i have uh, i have three tables in uh, three tables in my entrainment room and so I can actually work with three people at one time. Uh, and honestly, I find it tremendously beneficial. Uh, one, in terms of the work, there's always going to be time that we're leaving that person to process and integrate mm -hmm. what's being done. That's where a lot of that building the awareness comes into play. Um, it's not just an act and then it's done and then you move on. It's a part of a process just like life. Um, so in that... I can just check on the progress of somebody else while that one person is, uh, is integrating, is processing themselves. Um, so it becomes something more efficient, not so much downtime, we could say. It keeps me energized and really focused in what's going on. But also it creates a healing environment, uh, and that healing environment is tremendously powerful. So we can say on an energetic perspective, um, one person who is really opening and releasing and making shifts and change, it changes that whole field in the room. So anybody else in the room is able to, to take part in that. And just to make it simple so people can understand, I take it to if we, want, if we want to pray or if we want to meditate, even if we want to party, we can go do it all alone in a room. But as soon as we get in a room with, you know, maybe two, three, five, ten other people, there's this whole other dynamic which comes into place. There's a different energy. So in terms of getting into that, uh, into that state, it's much easier. Um, but also, as different people process and go through, it allows other individuals to do the same, maybe without having to do it all themselves. So it actually becomes a healing environment where we're sharing as community and realizing that whatever issues I have going on, you know what? Everybody else, it's a part of the human experience. Everybody mm -hmm. else has them. They just have their own story. Uh, their own particular issues. So building those community ties, I think, is tremendously uh, powerful in the healing process. So I have a question. When yeah. you, when individuals make an appointment with you, for example, if I came in and I made an appointment with you, mm -hmm. so I would not necessarily know the person on the other tables? Or, no. So it's just done all in the same room, basically. So when you come in for the first time, it would just be you and I face to face. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would just be you and I face to face so that we can actually talk about 
whatever your health issues are, whatever your health goals are, um, so that we could actually do an examination and analysis. And that first visit is actually just, uh, just myself with you. Um, because I want you to, you're going to get my undivided attention, um, but also in that visit just for you to start to get a little acclimated to the area. And then I just explain to people that this is the way we work. Whenever we have something private that needs to be said, we've got the office mm-hmm. for any private conversations. Um, but you know what? Nobody really has a problem with that. Um, friendships end up being started uh, from, that, from that interaction, from people actually being on their healing journey mm-hmm. and seeing other people and participating in a sense with other people on their healing journey. So everybody remains fully clothed. In, in the room, so so there really are no issues around uh, around privacy in that sense. Um, and then anybody who does have have issues, we just we talk about them and we address them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lovely, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go party. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> Glenn, you're on one table. I'll be on another, and Segovia will be on the other. <laughs> there you go. There you, you go. go. Come, come on down. Because that, that, that's Wagner the most powerful thing in the world. That that's the most powerful thing in the world. Families that get in and to care together, to heal together, any any kind of working environment like that, amazingly powerful because the the connections between us all that uh, that affect our health, our well being, sometimes our mannerisms and our behaviors, as it starts to shift in one, it shifts in the other, and uh, tremendously powerful. It's a wonderful idea. Uh huh. I'll just bring the table over to the studio and, uh, <laughs> and uh, or actually bring over three so we can get you all together and we'll get it all taken care of. Burton? <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Um, Burton, you talked about your influences of the Asian arts. Uh, mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that and how that has been incorporated into your mindset and your healing process. Uh, it was years ago that I just, uh, I was introduced to acupuncture and then, uh, the acupuncturist I was seeing was also very interested in, uh, was an oriental medical doctor. So it wasn't just acupuncturist, it was oriental medical doctor and just the, um, within oriental medicine, you know, the whole concept of chi, that there is this generating life energy, uh, which manifests in, in, Brings things about. It just that just resonated with me as uh, as something true, and uh, and it's all just about finding different ways of getting it to uh, to access and manifest. Um, so really, it was a lot of the philosophy, uh, mm-hmm. and then I always I always loved the um, the more holistic perspective that uh, that I know typically within Oriental medicine. No matter what the symptom is. There's still this address of the individual and the person and how there are all these different components that tie into whatever might be producing that, uh, that symptom. I love that, uh, that concept and that idea from uh, oriental medicine that you only paid the doctor when you were going for your regular preventative visits and then you didn't pay the doctor if you actually got sick because uh, there was that idea that the doctor is there to help you actually maintain your health and it just if something happens that's not the time to pay the doctor that's the doctor just to get you back to um so there was a whole philosophy around the application of it that just made a tremendous amount of sense to me and uh and then getting into chiropractic and finding that there are really similar uh there's similar concepts similar beliefs you know there's just a different application it just seemed like a very natural extension of uh of uh of how i see things how it all seems to make sense Curiously, do you uh, relate gateways? You talked about a joint that might be blocked and you look for a Mm -hmm. gateway. Is there any relation to the meridians and acupuncture points with gateways? No, actually, there's no no relationship. Okay. No, no, no. That's that's just the the simplest answer. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I was waiting for a very esoteric answer, and that was... (laughs) Yeah, uh uh-huh. Well, you know what? Um... It's actually fun because with gateways and the somatopsychic wave, which is an undulation of the spine that's actually initiated through uh, network spinal analysis care, that's actually being studied at, uh, at a handful of universities around the world. There's a uh, mathematical 
uh, professor at USC who's studying the dynamics of the wave of this concept of, uh, of gateway. And uh, really what they're, they're discovering is just, um, it's really opening up the field of biology and how we look at and consider uh, biology in the human organism. But it's still so far ahead of, I think, what most all of us can comprehend. Because I sit down with him, but, you know, what he's talking about is mathematical formulas and uh, just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's like it's it's very interesting, wow. but it's so uh, it's so mathematical, and really what it is is they're just finding that it's in terms of gateway, we consider that really a gateway, so gateway between the physical body and the energetic body. Mm. There is okay. an energetic sense to our being that I think we've got. There's enough standard science that has showed that to be true. Um, also within the oriental, the, the oriental concepts, there is, there's that idea that there's that energy of the body. And the same way here, just that there is that energy of the body, the gateway is, is a bridge, a connection between that energetic and the physical. Um, and really, if we're going to optimize that health and well-being, we need to have that connection between the physical and the energetic. Um, that, the, that the physical is just actually representing what's happening on the energetic, the ener energetic on the physical. So, so that really becomes a bridge between the two, whereas a meridian um, is really a point along that energy highway. Mm. And, you know, I can't say because I really don't know how an acupuncturist or, or an oriental medical doctor decides what point on that highway to stimulate mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know how that thought process goes into that, but you could draw a, a, a little bit of a relation maybe that way, um, in that that gateway is that bridge to connect to the two, and so that's what we're looking to stimulate. But there's, you know, a process we go through to determine uh, which is the gateway for what individual. So really, in a sense, it's your, your body is telling me, I'm getting different parameters, I'm getting different signs and signals from you, from your body. Um, which really tells me where we need to go. So in a sense, it's your process, and I'm assisting you in your process uh, more than I'm doing things to you as you're just kind of like passively there waiting for me to finish. You talked before, uh, you mentioned a few moments ago about the oriental medicine doctors that get paid for prevention. Uh, yeah. Is that any part of your practice where you work with people uh, to prevent problems or do you wait for the problems to occur and then they come to you? You know, I always try to educate people that uh, prevention and being proactive is the best thing to do. Um, we don't have to wait for symptoms just to, to go and get a checkup and see how we're doing. But now that depends on who we're working with and what their, uh, what their mindset, what their practice is. A lot of our healthcare system is based on symptoms. So most of us, we've just been grown up in a culture where if you don't have a symptom, you don't need to go see anybody because you're fine. But the thing that I love is that typically then if I ask people, I go, okay, so are you telling me you are at the top of your game? 100% can't get any better. Pretty much everybody is like, well, no, I don't have this or I don't have that, but maybe, well, my sleep isn't as good as it could be. Well, I guess I do have a little too much stress. I guess I do have this. I guess I do have that. Um, so we're in a, in a culture that says, wait until you're broke to go get fixed. Whereas if we're really going to have an amazing health, physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, that's something to be proactive about. And, uh, and within the work that I do, I'm looking first at the state of your spine and your nervous system. And I want to associate what I find there with your experience of life. So that if it's a matter of getting better because something is broke right now, then it's about getting better because it's broke right now. If there's nothing quote unquote broke right now, well, then let's talk about how we can take it up to the next level, how you can be more energetic, more dynamic more present, more creative. How does that sound? Well, then we can work on making that a reality. Christina, are you at the top of your game? <laughs> <laughs> I'm bouncing. I know, I see her. I She's bouncing. What She's smiling. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think, I mean, the, the moment you think that you're at the top of your game, mm -hmm. I think there's an issue. 
because I, I believe that we are the most amazing, amazing creatures. Yeah. And there's yeah. never a limit. There's never a top. Oh. We can just keep expanding our bodies, our mind, our spirits. And, and there is no top of game. I mean, no. as far as I'm concerned, we're, I feel I'm always doing great. <laughs> but you know that's because i'm always striving for the next and the next and the next and you know the yeah. higher i can bounce right glenn <laughs> that's right that's right amplitude mm -hmm. and frequency there you yeah. go <laughs> that's well yeah, you're talking about it and it was actually just real quick um they actually did a retrospective study out of uh, uc irvine uh with over two thousand uh network patients and basically, they were. Just, it was a retrospective study to uh, to really get a sense of where they were in terms of quality of life. In a nutshell, what they found is uh, all of those individuals uh, had an increased quality of life. Even the people who were already doing yoga and eating organic and uh, and trying to do all the good things, uh, with this care added in, that increased the benefits like fivefold. Um, but the most amazing thing in it is that they found that there was no ceiling. So for everybody at different stages of going through care, this was, you know, in a retrospective study, they found that there was no ceiling for people going through care. Mm. There was no end point. It was like, yeah, no, we can constantly be taking it up and taking it up and taking it up and taking it up. Uh, and that for me is something, it's like, it's really exciting because mm. that's what, that's the kind of world I imagine living in. Mm. Everybody is just energy rich and dynamic and knows that they have this amazing power and potential within themselves. And you know what? They're just all about manifesting it and sharing it with everyone else and letting everyone else have that same, that same opportunity. Mm -hmm. Love it. Yeah. See, I told you one big party. Yeah. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. there you go. <laughs> yeah. So a few months ago, I received a phone call from a friend of mine who uh, we were actually planning on an interview. He has a son who has a brain tumor who has gone through uh, surgeries and chemotherapy and a number of other things. And he also has a, a younger son who had some <clears throat> personality issues and a, a number of other things, just not happy in life. And he called me and, and told me about this amazing person he was seeing uh, and he wanted to introduce me to uh, him, and it turned out to be you. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Bravo. And so uh, he was telling me how his son, who was working at a second grade, the, the other son without the brain tumor, was working on a second grade level, and you started working with him in a program, mm -hmm. and suddenly he's getting A's in his class. He's Many things are happening to him on physical, mental, spiritual, uh, emotional levels. Mm -hmm. And this had to do with your bliss program, I'm assuming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So let's let's introduce ourselves to the bliss program. First, tell us what it is, and then tell us what the training is for that, and then we'll talk a little more about it. Mm -hmm. the The bliss program it's really it's a holistic approach to any kind of attention or behavior, social skills, learning, developmental delay issues. The focus is really on the brain. Uh, there's the right brain, the left brain, so the focus is really on what's happening within the brain. Also what's happening within the spine, core posture, core postural muscles of the body, nutrition, how that ties into, because now we know more and more, especially with all of the, the books and the specials of uh, Dr. Perlmutter, uh, you know, that gut-brain connection. Um, so that nutrition is a part of it, and then also just Overall environmental, emotional, you know, uh, so it's a very holistic program looking at saying, okay, you know what, there are these issues. It may get this diagnosis or that diagnosis, but we tend to see it more on a spectrum. That spectrum is associated with a delay in development of one side of the brain compared to the other. That delay in development we call a functional disconnection syndrome. Uh, and that imbalance in the brain we call a hemisphericity. So that, and this is where it kind of branches off into, into something else, in that the left brain has certain functions, the right brain has other functions. When the two are working together in unison and at the same level, then that's really when we're going to see all of those outward signs of intelligence, behavior, and everything else we would expect and really age-appropriate. Um, when those two are not on the same page, we could say, 
that's when we're going to see an imbalance. If I take a 10-year-old and a 7-year-old and I put them together and I say, okay, you guys, just go out and play, do whatever you want, there's really not much of an issue. But now if I take that 7 and 10 and I say, okay, we're going to sit down in class, you guys work as a team, and I want to see 10th grade level work. Well, that seven-year-old is not going to be able to carry his portion of the weight. So we're not going to see that scholastic aptitude that we expect. Um, same thing in terms of behavior. A 10-year-old, seven-year-old, they don't behave at the same level. So if I'm expecting behavior at a 10-year-old level, I'm not necessarily going to see it. And so within this, it's, we're not saying it's just bad character or bad parenting. It's there's actual physical things happening within the body and the brain that just are not working the way they should, and that's what we look to uncover, and that's what we address in the BLISS program. So before we actually get into the BLISS program, what's the training for it? Training, training really for the BLISS program, I went through a specialized training with, uh, with Dr. Pauly, uh, where we had, uh, we had a six, I could say a six-month intensive, because we typically right now, most who go through his program are already trained chiropractors who mm. have either done a specialty in neurology or not. Um, but even if not, then that's, you know, just the, the catch up on, uh, on your own, um, which also takes us into expanding further out into functional medicine. Uh, into understanding more about uh, digestion. So there's a, an intensive six-month program with him, and then we have uh, weekly to bi-weekly conference calls so that uh, you can kind of think of it as like a round table, that he's always giving us his newest uh, tidbits in the research that he's uncovered, that he's discovered, and then also a chance for us to share really our clinical experience so that we're aiding and learning from each other. Uh, but I'll tell you, there's a lot of independent study that, uh, that goes into it as well, just to get deeper into the neurology, how the neurology is functioning, into nutrition and the digestive system, how they're functioning and operating, so that we're capable of really putting together this holistic process. Because most practitioners out there today, they'll work on these issues, but they work they, they address them through their specialty. A nutritionist just comes from nutrition. And you know what? If the issue is 90% nutrition, then we're probably going to see an amazing resolution just by addressing the nutrition. But if that's not 90% of what's causing the issue, then we end up in this, uh, in, this, in this area of like, okay, well, we tried nutrition, but you know what? It didn't make a difference. So I guess it's not that. No, maybe that's just not the biggest piece of the puzzle. So we really bring in this holistic perspective to address everything that we see needs to be addressed. And some need more attention than others, but the whole picture needs to be addressed. When we're, when we're looking at this, uh, and you talk about developmental delay of, yeah. say, one side of the brain versus the other, how do we actually know that? I mean, from... Uh, from my scientific point of view, there might be a little skepticism here mm -hmm. in terms in terms of saying the brain is actually this side of the brain is actually not developed, especially when we're seeing functional uh, imaging studies where the brain seemed to be functioning, maybe a disconnection somewhere, but not uh, mm -hmm. development. Mm -hmm. So that that disconnection can also be another another way of looking at it. Um, the brain goes through phases in its development, that there's uh, in utero through about two to three years, it's predominantly the right brain, which is, is more in development, and it switches over to the left, and every couple of years, it just kind of switches back and forth, right, left, in its development. If there's any kind of uh, trauma, ass uh, assault on the body, it could be uh, toxic, it could be a fall hitting the head. It could be a heavy emotional problem that happened in the family. Maybe there's a divorce, a death. Um, something that can just interrupt that normal development can lead to uh, this, this delay, this hemisphericity. This, a little bit like you were saying, Glenn, there's that lack of connection. Um, you know, but like, how do we see it? How do we see it from the outside? Well, a part of seeing it from the outside is knowing that... In terms of sympathetics, the sympathetic system, so driving uh, how the blood vessels are working, blood circulation, that's actually uh, same-sided output in the body. 
So we could do a bilateral uh, blood pressure. And ideally, bi bilateral blood pressure, we should see it the same or within, you know, a number or two between right and left. Sure. If we've got a difference of like 10, well, then you know that the sympathetics are off. Or you have to start asking yourself, why is there a difference of 10 points between the right and the left? Or People an anatomical that, defect. Maybe there is an anatomical defect, if that's the only thing we're looking at. Yeah, pupil dilation, um, right. same thing, tied in with the sympathetic. So do we have the pupil on one side, which is larger than the other? In terms of muscular output, uh, it's same-sided for the anterior muscles on the front, uh, above T6, above a certain part, the middle of the back, and then for the, the back, uh, the posterior muscles, below. Uh, so in terms of testing just inherent muscle strength, um, is there a correlated weakness? Or with that inhibition that we normally should see just for an individual who's walking and we have that coordinated right-left movement, we could see that that individual actually has the shoulder turned in and then the foot is turned out so that the muscles that should normally be inhibited, which allows the posture to straighten up, are not being inhibited. And then going into a behavior with the immune system, being simple, I say the, the left side is like the gas pedal and the right side is like the brake. So the left side of the brain actually stimulates the immune system. The right side is more for suppressing the immune system. So if we have an immune system which is not being suppressed the way it should be, then we would tend to find an individual who has a tremendous amount of allergies. They've got a really hyperreactive immune system. But the reverse, if it's somebody that their immune system is more predominantly suppressed and not being activated as much, then in a history we would find an individual, normally a child who's been on a course of antibiotics after course of antibiotics after course of antibiotics, you know, by the time they're 10, they've already had 12 or 13 course of antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So... By understanding just kind of the roles that the right and left brain play, as you start looking at behavior, left side of the brain, that's more for that curious, uh, curious outgoing behavior. The right side of the brain, it's more that uh, voice of reason, cautious behavior. So ideally, we've got a nice balance between this right left of being curious enough to go out there and do stuff, but that voice of reason that we're not going to get ourselves killed. Right. Um, but when there's that imbalance, then what we see in the behavior is we might see, oh, yeah, he's just a risk taker, like I'm afraid he's going to kill himself, or totally withdrawn, doesn't seem to really get involved with anybody or anything. And so there is no hard and fast test. But right. it's through all of these, what you know being a doctor, what we call soft signs, that we begin to put together a picture of what's going on. I have to I have to say that I'm I'm not quite as sure about right versus left in many of those cases as we're learning more about the functional uh, aspects of the brain and all the different connections. Uh, I think Woody. we're we're going to see you know much much more complex uh, things when you talk about the immune system or risk taking and everything else. But I think it's a okay. good place to be working on it and and at least to observe it for the the practice of it so i'm i'm assuming right now that if a if a family has a child that's acting inappropriate they're not paying attention in school they're they're acting out sometimes they're withdrawn they have hyperactivity uh, a number of different things mm -hmm. uh the and they come to you uh my my concept is that first you're going to make sure that they don't have some kind of a lesion in their brain that can be surgically repaired or uh, chemically uh, modified. And when you've eliminated those things, then you start working on the practice that the Bliss program offers. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. There's, it's always, uh, we, we always need to rule out certain possibilities. Uh, and then see if, uh, if the child or the individual is, uh, is appropriate for the program. That's uh, a part of the initial assessment is really doing a complete health history 
and and getting all the information, the pieces of the puzzle that are there, doing really a complete examination, um, where I'm really, do I see all of these deficits that lead me to believe this is what's going on and that this, uh, this child, this individual, is an appropriate candidate for the BLISS program? Uh, and and if that's the case, then then we can go ahead and get started with the program. And and if it's not the case, because I've already done a few assessments with a few other individuals, that mm -hmm. uh, the the issues that that they were coming in for uh, really were stemming from other things. One in particular was much more uh, emotional. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of and the issues that were there are much more just emotional, emotionally linked. And so it was having a conversation with the mother about addressing those things. Mm -hmm. And you work on programs that that tie in and try to improve focused portions of the brain uh, that get kids to get a little more coordinated to to start using parts of the brain in a multinodal fashion uh, mm -hmm. uh, that normally isn't done. This is kind of a supplemental medicine in a way. In in a way, in a way, we could look mm -hmm. at it uh, look at it that way that. Um, there's, there's a lot of different aspects we're going to look at. How the eyes are tracking and following can be a part of it. The balance and the equilibrium is a part of it. The core postural muscles, uh, just so that we're resisting gravity, our core postural muscles are sending information stimulation up to the brain uh, constantly, constantly. So if those core postural muscles are not functioning the way they should, that's a big piece of that stimulation for the brain uh, maturing the way it should, which is not there. The the spine, it's something that we address really specifically in the BLISS program, um, knowing just how important the health of the spine and spinal mechanics ties into uh, brain function, brain development, was uh, a, Nobel, uh, a Nobel laureate that his name escapes me right now, and I feel terrible for that. Uh, he won the Nobel Prize in 81 for his, uh, his research on the brain. And basically what he was finding is that about 90% of the stimulation and nutrition for the brain comes from movement of the spine. Being that movement of the spine is going to be pushing up the CSF, bringing a lot of that nutrition, but also there's all of that core postural muscle and all of that receptor information which goes into helping the brain develop. So that if that is not present, and today, unfortunately, we live in a very sedentary society. Um, so a lot of that key stimulation that should be there for aiding in the development is not there. What's very exciting for me is that right now in Western medicine, we have the surgeries and the chemotherapies and the medications for kids with ADHD and autism and a number of other things. And this is going to add other programs to this. I know a lot of the different therapists in the Western world are starting to use some of these techniques. And what I like about it is that with, uh, with the BLISS program, hopefully there's going to be a number of actual double-blind, placebo-controlled, uh, randomized studies that are going to really change the way we practice medicine. So I'm very excited about that. We're talking with Dr. Burton Wagner, a chiropractor who works in network spinal analysis and the BLISS program. We're coming to the end of our show, and we wonder if you have a health tip for us. A health, it's, uh, you know, I do. The health tip I have, it's maybe not a typical... A typical health tip, uh, it's not a eat this, um, but it's more, it's a quote. Uh, Howard Thurman, um, for me the health tip is if you are truly being yourself and who you are, you're going to have amazing health. And it's a, it's a quote I heard from, uh, his name's Howard Thurman, uh, African-American preacher, um, that he said, don't ask yourself what the world needs to go do that. Ask yourself what makes you come alive. And go do that. Mm. Because what the world needs are people who have come alive. That's really my health tip. Beautiful. Do what makes you come alive. Because you are going to have amazing health if you have truly come alive and are yourself. That's great. You know, Burton, it's very interesting in our health tips that we always <laughs> ask. <laughs> I don't think we've had anyone that says, eat spinach. 
<laughs> eat, eat spinach, eat kale three times a day. Eat kale. It, it's always no, juice goes, it, juice it. <laughs> that's, right. that's right. It always goes in a different direction. It's always fascinating for us, and we really love that. Burton, when you were uh, preparing for this show, is there anything that you wanted to mention that we haven't discussed yet in our final minute or two? In preparing for the show, n- no, I don't have anything. I'm probably forgetting something. Would you just have to come back? Oh, I'd be and, happy and, to. And next time with your lovely wife, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm sure she would love to. That We'll get a little bit more of the French accent going. And, uh, and uh, yeah, no, we would love to. Love to. I love, uh, I love what you're doing. I think it's fantastic. And actually helping encourage individuals just to, to move forward. Mm. In, the, in their health and be more empowered, more knowledgeable and more empowered. I think it's, I think it's fantastic what, uh, what you guys are doing here and what you're putting together. And I'm thrilled that I could, uh, I could participate and be a part of it. Mm. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. And we're, we're always excited to meet people like yourself that are out there uh, trying to promote optimal health for the rest of our planet. I'm really grateful to our very special guest, Dr. Burton Wagner, chiropractor, network spinal analysis practitioner, and bliss program practitioner. I'm also grateful to my healers and my educators and teachers for allowing me on my journey. Grateful to and thankful to Christina and Yoga Hub and Magical Medical Tour with Segovia producing the program. And I look forward to getting together with everyone again uh, next time as we search another quadrant of the healthcare galaxy Uh, Until that time, thank you so much, Dr. Burton Wagner, and I wish you all optimal health. (laughs) Thank you so much, Dr. Wagner. It's been truly a pleasure, and you've uh, really taken us, uh, given us another step to raising that awareness around the planet. It's fantastic. We love the work that you're doing. Thank you very much. And of course, thank you, Dr. Glenn Woolman, for another fabulous show. And to each and every one of you for joining us in this new platform of education and information. We're grateful for your continuous support. And we look forward to hearing your feedback on how we can serve you better. If you would like to learn more about Dr. Burton Wagner, we invite you to visit his website, SpinalVitality.com. And if you would like to learn more about this amazing the Bliss Program, do so at theblissprogram.com. And of course, connect with Dr. Glenn Woolman through his website, glennwoolman.com, where we always encourage you to learn more about his metaphor, Square Breath. Again, we are grateful for any feedback, comments, suggestions that you might have, any subject matters that you'd like us to cover. At any time, give us a call at 818-LET'S-TALK. 818 Let's talk. Thank you for joining us today. And until next time, namaste. Um, I, I was trying to uh, you know, strengthen my body as much as I could, as well as my mind and spirit. And I think that played a real factor in my, in my surgery because it was a very good outcome. What were the what were the toughest parts preparing? Well, there's there's an element of uncertainty, you know, and there's really nothing you can do about the uncertainty except accept it and um, you know just prepare for uh, different types of outcomes. 